Perfect. So again, my name is Namita Herze and I work in the research project um, Histories of Philosophy in a Global Perspective, supervised by Rolf Elberfeld. And I will talk today about philosophical mechanisms of marginalization in a global perspective. So my talk today is divided into three sections concerning different mechanisms of marginalization that have been practiced within academia in the last hundreds of years. And first, I will give you an insight into my paper where I analyze different global histories of philosophies and their mechanisms of exclusion. And I published this paper in the Polylog in December. It's an edition that we all had within the project. We all wrote an article for the Polylog. And the second part of my talk concerns the marginalization of oral philosophy from the historiography of philosophy. And I will argue not only that it is time to integrate oral philosophy and oral philosophical traditions into our canon, but also that the European tradition is based on oral transmissions. So thirdly, I will argue that mechanisms of marginalizations are also carried out in relation to non-European women in the philosophical context. So now I will start with the first section of my talk by addressing different works of the world history of philosophy or global history of philosophy and how a philosophical global history can be constituted is a question that has not yet found a concrete and generally accepted answer. So if one compares the approaches of global histories of philosophy that have appeared so far, it becomes clear that some of them differ greatly from one another in their approaches and in the topics they deal with. So now I will analyze different global histories of philosophy by comparing the content of selected publications in order to find which cultures, systems of thought, and traditions are favored in these writings and which traditions have been excluded or marginalized. And the majority of the publication I look at were published in English, but particular works are also considered in German, French and Italian language. With the Italian, I also got some help from Francesca. <laughs> um, so in the 21st century, the first beginnings of a turnaround in the historiography of philosophy in European languages can be observed. So after the previous and sometimes still existing Eurocentric worldview that dominated academia between the 18th and the 20th century, in which the image of philosophical historiography was fundamentally shaped by European thinkers, a change is now slowly taking place. And this change is reflected in a slowly growing integration of hetero marginalized cultures and their philosophical traditions in recent works on the history of philosophy. So in, in particular, under titles such as world history of philosophy or global history of philosophy, a greater variety of regional philosophical traditions are increased, increasingly being included into the philosophical historiography. So 
on this slide, you can see all the histories of philosophy that I analyzed within my article. So um, there's like smart, from smart world philosophy, but also from Hohenstein, philosophy, Atlas, and Ganeri, Oxford history of philosophy, and also Peter Adamson's history without any gaps. He has this podcast and he made some books out of it. So it is noticeable that a variety of approaches of uh, of approaches to make global philosophies can be found in European languages. So these range from topic-centered, geographically oriented histories to chronologically oriented histories. And despite diverse approaches, there are some features that stand out in a comparative view. So if you compare all of these, you will find first that Indian philosophy followed closely by Chinese and Japanese philosophy is most covered. Therefore, the representation of philosophical traditions in different regions of the world is totally unbalanced. So there tends to be a strong emphasis on Asia, which could be due to the richness of the available written material of Asian philosophies, as well as to a long established tradition in European philosophy dealing with Asia. Also Francesca um, just talked about it. Um, Leibniz even called the Chinese culture as Europe of the West in his work Novissima Sinica and Schopenhauer emphasized an extreme importance of Indian philosophy in his Wille als Welt und Vorstellung. So it's not surprising at all um, due to the work of European philosophers such as Leibniz or Schopenhauer who have worked extensively on Asian philosophy that Asian philosophies especially emphasized within the works on histories of world philosophy. So the second point that stands out by comparing all of these histories is that Asian philosophy is highlighted in works on global philosophy and both South America and Africa, as well as philosophies of indigenous peoples are, are either categorically excluded or treated only marginally. So, the reason for this can probably be found primarily in the scripture centeredness of academic philosophy and the accompanying exclusion of oral philosophical traditions. So thirdly, it becomes clear that there is a deficit of differentiated engagement with prevailing exclusions and exclusion mechanisms in philosophy and its historiography as the exclusion of Latin America, the exclusion of Africa, the exclusion of indigenous cultures and so on. They are not really being mentioned within these histories of global philosophies. And also the authors of the histories of world philosophy, they do not reflect on this exclusion they practice. So probably they are just not aware of how they practice exclusion. So in order to integrate non-European philosophical tradition into the historiography of philosophy in European languages, both a critical examination of the current philosophical discipline and the reform in its method and concepts are needed. So having this in mind, that research on oral traditions allow Western philosophers to learn from ancient indigenous knowledge, especially from F Latin America, 
it's important that we start learning about these traditions. So research on this topic would broaden the philosophical horizon by opening up to cultural traditions that have been categorized, categorized as barbaric for many centuries. So they were the savages and they were not able to think logically and philosophically. This is like the prejudice that is practiced. So it is time to familiarize oneself with the idea of transforming the term philosophy in itself by considering not only written philosophy but also oral philosophy and indigenous philosophy. With this being said, I will now come to the second section of my talk that mainly concerns the question of oral philosophy. So even though there are still strong mechanisms of marginalization at hand concerning indigenous and oral philosophy. There has been an increase in the reconstruction of the intellectual heritage of formerly colonially oppressed and still marginalized communities within oral knowledge. This new appearing research on philosophical concepts and traditions of Native Americas and First Nation peoples in North America, Central and South America, Australia, New Zealand, Africa, is now being more practiced. So, in addition to societies with very old written traditions, we also find societies, for example, on the African continent with oral traditions in which all forms of knowledge like historical, religious, ethical, political, medical, and technological knowledge were passed on orally from generation to generation. For example, in the form of traditional stories, legends, myths, and proverbs, or in the form of dance, song, rituals, artistic or religious artifacts, in some cases, even into the 21st century. So societies with oral traditions are not to be understood as an antithesis to written cultures. Rather, oral traditions also exist in societies with a widespread written culture, just as predominantly all societies did not necessarily have no writing or notation system at all. For example, if you look at the Aztec language, Nuatl, um, you can see that they have a writing system. So it is characteristic that in these societies, writing was just not the most important tool for the transmission and dissemination of knowledge. And dealing with the philosophical heritage in orally transmitted tradition is one of the most difficult challenges for the text-centered discipline of the historiography of philosophy. So at the same time, the demand for equal treatment of marginalized and suppressed indigenous knowledge traditions is a core concern of efforts to decolonize thought and the sciences. In particular, the liberation of oral traditions of formerly colonially oppressed peoples from their marginalized position 
in the system of science is one of the central concerns of practicing decolonial theory. So if we want to decolonize philosophy, we have to look at oral traditions. So its representatives demand that orality be recognized as a quality in its own right and not devalued as deficiency. This also concerns the discipline of philosophy, which is called upon to leave its Eurocentric position and to take into account the philosophical heritage of indigenous knowledge traditions, a heritage that is not generally understood as a part of the discipline in academic philosophy today. So important questions need to be clarified in connection with the status of orally transmitted philosophical concepts and traditions. These include most fundamentally the questions of, first, what criteria should be used to distinguish philosophical concepts and ideas in oral tradition from other forms of knowledge or myths, legends and sayings of wisdom. Second, which practices in societies with oral tradition transmissions are philosophically relevant and who decides what is relevant and what is not relevant? Third, where and how does philosophical knowledge manifest itself when it's not written down? Fourth, where should one look for the philosophy of oral traditions? So in addition, a number of further methodological questions arise. First, how can one approach these traditions? Especially if we are white coming from Europe, we don't speak any non-European language. How can we approach these traditions? Secondly, doesn't every act of writing down oral traditions already go hand in hand with an epi epistemic break and thus a falsification of the tradition? So how do we deal with the break of writing down oral tradition? And a question that is extremely difficult to clarify in oral traditions, what role does authorship play in philosophy? Because some ethno philosophers, they um, argue that the philosophy of indigenous cultures or from some African cultures that they have like a communal philosophy and a communal philosophical system. But in our Eurocentric philosophy practice, we practice with authorship. So how can we approach this question, how to um, deal with authors that are not here? and not mentioned. So unresolved methodological issues, however, are often not the crucial reason why efforts to reappraise orally transmitted philosophical traditions, whether in the Americas, in Australia, New Zealand or Africa, face persistent ignorance or skepticism. Rather, it is oft, often the prejudices ranging from general doubts about the capacity of certain peoples for philosophy and logic to the prioritization of written texts that have so far prevented a serious consideration of the possibility of philosophy in societies with a predominantly an oral transmission of tradition. So one main objection is based on the assumption 
that writing is the prerequisite for more abstract and thus also philosophical and logical thinking. And this is the question. Shall we keep the thought that writing is necessary for practicing philosophy? So it is one of the widespread basic assumption that the medium of writing is a necessary prerequisite that makes abstract philosophical thinking possible in the first place. However, this assumption ignores the fact that the beginnings of European philosophy in ancient Greece were based on oral traditions. Oral traditions have been influential for many centuries in all regions and cultures of the world, including Europe. So oral philosophy was not only practiced in continents like Africa or Latin America. Until the invention of printing in the 15th century, written texts in Europe were only accessible to a few specialists, while the majority of people lived in an oral culture in Europe. And Jan Asman, for example, explicitly points out that the great texts of ancient Greece, which form the foundation of our European culture, reproduce oral speech. Also, in the Oxford Handbook of Plato, they emphasize the oral genesis of the Platonic works, namely in the form of a lecture to an interested audience in the academy, which was only written down afterwards. So it was not until the reformation and especially the age of enlightenment that a broader literacy of the population began. And apart from that, the Socratic dialogues, they are orally transmitted. So, despite widespread skepticism about the possibility of oral philosophy in other regions of the world, it seems to be no contradiction for many philosophers to devote themselves to the interpretation of pre-Socratic and Platonic dialogues who are also based on oral transmissions. So here a clear imbalance becomes apparent in the treatment of non-European sources, especially of those in which philosophical interpretations of oral traditions have only recently been put into reform and in an academic setting. So the anchoring of European philosophy in oral traditions is hardly present today. Consequently, within the historical development of philosophical discourse in the European tradition, oral origins were mostly forgotten through the subsequent centuries of written interpretations of one's oral sources. So other recognized philosophical traditions are also based on oral traditions. This is especially the case for Indian philosophy. And Indian philosophy is totally accepted as philosophical concept in the West, and for almost a full millennium since the 8th century before the change of the calendar, philosophy and science were practiced and transmitted orally in India. The great epos Mahabharata, as well as the language Sanskrit itself, was orally transmitted in original. Also, in China, one can find a long tradition of oral philosophy. Confucius never wrote anything himself. He imported his wisdom in conversations with students. A classic example of his teaching is known under the title Conversations. And this is a collected 
reflection of Confucius sayings and dialogues with his disciples, which were compiled by them and their own disciples only after his death. So what is remarkable about this example is that although Confucius spread his teachings and ideas orally, he himself was anchored in the context of a written tradition. This is therefore an interesting case of an overlap between oral and written interactions. So this example makes cl clear that orality and writing are neither hierarchical or in opposition to each other. They work with each other. And we also see now that um, philosophy students, they watch YouTube videos to um, have some people, some influencers tell them about the philosophy. So oral traditions are also now more, coming more and more because of the new media. So it goes hand in hand, oral tradition and writing tradition. So if European philosophy, Indian philosophy and Chinese philosophy is on many levels rooted in a transmission of oral philosophy, why are we still ignoring oral traditions of indigenous cultures? There are definitely some steps into the right direction integrating different oral traditions. So for example, there is a project, project of Odera Uruka about the wisdom of African sages who have been interviewed. And also a project by Sophie Oluwole who compares the philosophy of Socrates with the wise Orun Mila from the Yoruba religion of West Africa. So these are examples on how oral philosophy is being approached nowadays in academics and are just slowly beginning to research on these topics. So having in mind that oral philosophy is of great importance, not only for several indigenous peoples, but also for academia to approach a decolonial perspective, it, is, it nonetheless makes sense to distinguish between philosophical relevant material on the one hand, which is unfolded in its meaning through the analysis and processing by a specialized philosopher. And on the other hand, philosophical traditions and currents. The latter have the origin in the past and are based on works, statements, or practices of philosophizing by authors to whom a theory or a tradition of thought can be traced. So the reappraisal of philosophically relevant material on the one hand is to be viewed differently. Although the scope here is wide because all kinds of manifestations of knowledge and social life, but also of nature can attain as philosophical relevant and is also visible in the context of European philosophy like philosophy of sport, philosophy of media, philosophy of film, so a lot can be philosophically relevant, whereas um, not everything is a philosophical tradition because for the philosophical tradition, you really need the authorship. So considering the question of authorship, it is also important to emphasize that a documentation of women's contributions to philosophy and its history can only succeed if authorship remains an important criterion within philosophy. This leads me now shortly to section three, where I will briefly say some sentences about the marginalization of women philosophers. So I think I will be finished in about five minutes. A big challenge for the reconstruction of oral philosophy has to do with the fact that there is only little text material that can be used for philosophical research. 
this is also a challenge within the research on women philosophers. Women have often been forced to use other media of expression than classical philosophical texts. There are some written sources by women from the European as well as the Asian tradition, but these are often different types of texts than are normally used for the history of philosophy. So especially in indigenous philosophy, women have often used different media of expression, such as art, dance, poetry. And Rolf Elberfeld, our supervisor, he often emphasizes that in academic philosophy, it's important to pay closer attention to the practices of philosophy to the many different practices of philosophizing. So the question here is whether philosophically relevant practices to be examined really always have to be only linguistic. Elberfeld argues that this is not the case, but that we shall pay closer attention to practice that also concerns the body actively. Questions like these need to be highlighted within the process of reconstructing the wisdom of women philosophers. For example, Shea Welsh, an, an present indigenous philosopher who speaks at a conference about women philosophers in the process of decolonization that organized this march, she emphasized on the importance of dance within indigenous philosophy and especially, as, and, and especially indigenous women philosophers. So this research on women philosophers is a sub aspect of our Kozalek project where we want to establish a theoretical foundation by examining the structural causes that have led to the exclusion of especially non-European women thinkers in order to overcome a tradition that has denied the intellectual competence of women in the system of domination throughout the history of colonization. So our goal is to find sources and to reconstruct the knowledge of marginalized women philosophers who have been excluded from the canon until today. So looking into standard histories of philosophy of all regions around the world raised naturally the questions, where are women philosophies, uh, philosophers and especially non-European women philosophers and their contributions in the histories of philosophy? Second, why are they rarely or not at all included? Third, what about African, Latin American, indigenous and Asian women philosophers? So the focus on women in academic philosophical research has been primarily on European women philosophers who often resisted oppression, stood up for women, were able to make a difference through their assertiveness and courage. However, revolutionary thinkers existed not only in Europe and the reconstruction of women of the global south who advocated for their gender through their philosophical activity in different cultures and languages fills a big gap with the works published on women philosophers. So the need to explicitly research philosophically relevant texts by non-canonical and non-European female authors and the need to examine, to examine the interrelated mechanisms of oppression, exclusion, of marginalization lies in the fact that so far only works by high class white women have largely been studied and represented. So by researching on female theorists who wrote in various languages on different continents and by reconstructing their works on the basis of a philosophical perspective, we hope that they can become part of a future historiography of philosophy. So obviously, if one considers publications and research projects on the topic to date, women have 
developed a greater sensitivity regarding the exclusion of their gender from the history of humanity in general and from the history of philosophy in particular. And they have endeavored to reform the historiography of philosophy. This is especially the case for the projects of Ruth Hagenhuber and Lisa Shapiro. But today I want explicitly to emphasize on the point that we now need to search for women philosophers that practiced philosophy in Africa, in Latin America, in Australia, in New Zealand and Asia, as well as for oral traditions to stop the ongoing mechanisms of marginalization. So this is the point that I want to make today. <laughs> And last but not least, I want to highlight that the topics I just talked about will be dealt with in greater detail within our project. So in March 2023, I will organize an online conference on non-canonical and non-European women philosophers. And in autumn 2023, there will be a conference about oral philosophy. So the whole conference will be about oral philosophy and there will be philosophers there who practice mainly on oral philosophy. Um, and this conference on oral philosophy will be organized by my supervisor Anke Granes in Hildesheim. It will be a live conference. The first one will be an online conference. And I also have to say that her work on African philosophy influenced most of my talk today. So if you want to receive further information about the conferences or if you have any other questions that cannot be dealt with today, I invite you to, I invite you to write me an email to my mail. And I thank you very much for listening to my talk. I'm looking forward to our discussion and yeah.